question, what is a sidecar? I'm glad you asked that. A sidecar motorcycle is a three-wheeled vehicle with the side wheel not directly aligned with the rear wheel. While the driver pilots the vehicle, the passenger rides in the side compartment. Sidecars were used extensively by German troops and police throughout World War II. After the war, sidecars became a popular alternative to automobiles throughout Europe because they were cheap, reliable, and easy to maintain. Sidecars had been racing in trial events since the 1930s, but it wasn't until 1949 that the Sidecar World Championships were inaugurated. Side sidecar racing became an official international sport that continued to grow in popularity across Europe. The first competing sidecars were regular motorcycles with a passenger car attached. In the 1950s, sidecars began to evolve away from the regular motorcycle designs, becoming lower to the ground with smaller diameter wheels. By the 1970s, they were using wide, slick tires with a square, car-like profile, and the passenger knelt inside of the passenger car instead of sitting. Sidecars continued to develop so they looked less like motorcycles and more like missiles. As they became more streamlined and powerful, they could go faster. Much faster. I mean, really, really, really fast. Question. Do people still race sidecars today? I'm glad you asked that. Welcome to the world of sidecar racing, the fastest two-person sport on asphalt. You'll meet some unusual characters who have a strong passion for this unique motorsport. You'll see three classes of machines, Formula One, Two, and Vintage Rigs. All of them fast, all of them dangerous. Enjoy the ride, but hang on for your life. My job is to be here. <clears throat> I can't reach the driver physically. It's I like I like the rush. I like the, um, the adrenaline. I like uh, embellishing how close to death I am, and uh, I like that feeling. It, it takes a lot of stress off me. Basically, I have uh, three positions here. The start. And my job right now is to load up the back wheel. This thing will not accelerate. The, the wheel will just spin unless my weight is here. So then I, I have a center position here where it's just in a straight line, which I'm basically doing nothing. And it's the only time I actually do nothing is when he's in a straight line. And this is my position for the left-hand corner. I keep my, my, my ass as far out as possible to keep the weight. And all I'm doing right now is making sure this wheel does not go in the air. All it's about transition and being as smooth as I possibly can. I like driving. I, I like the challenge of driving. It's, I guess, it's kind of my personality. I think almost all sidecar racers are Type A personalities, anyways. So. That's right. When Paul and I have had a good race, or we've done really well on the track, uh, all I got to do is, is look at Paul because he's sitting on the back there and he's pretty tired, but he's got a great big smile on his face, and I figure, okay, we did well. Paul and Ewan are members of the Sidecar Racers Association of North America. They've been racing together for three years and reached speeds up to 160 miles per hour. But with the thrill of speed comes the risk of danger. I like it. I like, uh, I like getting, going fast and feeling that I'm, my life's in peril. my own stop button I can stop the thing if I really want to not that I've ever really wanted to second accident on the bike was with Paul in the rain bike came around I was looking at the stands I never seen the stands before from that uh, vantage point knew I was going in the wrong direction and knew when it came around it wasn't gonna be good 
and when I tried to get the bike to turn back around forward again, it turned around forward, but extremely violently. Before I even knew it, didn't have any chance to react, I was in the air, looking down, thinking about Monday work. It's gonna hurt a lot. And I slid down the track with the bike on top of me as Paul went for a tumble in the grass. I landed on my head so I didn't get hurt. I stood up and looked and the sidecar was upside down and I could hear Ewan screaming. By the time the corner marshal caught up, I, I couldn't lift it myself. Um, the uh, Ewan was already crawling out. I had called him, how are you? He told me he was fine. I told him he sounded funny and he said, no, it was just, it was a good race and I'm tired. And I said, okay. And then when he came home Sunday and he could barely get out of his car and he could barely walk. Later on, he found out he did some uh, pretty bad back damage to himself. Oh, he was banged up pretty bad. I always, always have in the back of my mind, I have someone else on the back of this bike with me. And if I bush it or blow a corner and I flip the bike, it's not me getting hurt. It's There's another person involved here. And that always weighs very, very heavily on my mind when I'm racing. And uh, uh, I don't know if Paul believes that or not, but... <laughs> Husband and wife duo started racing together in 81. For Pete, a machinist turned full-time dad, and Addie, a doctor working in diagnostic radiology, their time on the track together has become a serious addiction. Uh, we're not making a living on it, it's for fun, so you gotta keep it all in perspective. If she's mean to me, I could put her in the curb, so. It doesn't happen quite, quite often. <laughs> During her first race, passenger Addie was so overwhelmed by the extreme G-force that Pete had to reach over and drag her back into the center of the platform. And now, well, nothing's too scary for Spider-Girl. The biggest challenge they face is balancing sport with family. We picked him up Friday after school and we have to drop him off on Monday. When I was a kid, loved the bikes, grew up with the bikes, always on a bike, and I wanted to go racing. The money wasn't there for it, so me and a buddy got together that we grew up together. We got together and we said, well, let's try the sidecars. It's okay, so we put our money together and we bought a sidecar. I couldn't drive it like he could, and he couldn't passenger it like I could, so he was the driver, I was the passenger, we, sh we shared the expense, and we did good, and it was great. Actually, his name's on the other side of the outfit there, because he rides everywhere with me. That sticker will, whatever, I paint the fare, and that sticker will go back on again. He's, he, he, he actually got killed in a road accident, like, about uh, four years after I'd emigrated to Canada. He'd carried on racing, he'd done really, really well, and my mum used to send me all the newspaper clippings and everything, and then he got killed in a road accident, so. When I was at Road America and I got the podium there, which was a surprise to me and a surprise to everybody else, I got the third place, and my wife said to me, you know, Howard's watching you, and I went, yeah, I guess. <laughs> everywhere with me because 
circus. I know he'd love what I'm doing now. <laughs> Steve has recently decided to share the love of his sport with the love of his life. He is taking his wife Bobby out on the track for her first time as a passenger. At 48, this mother of two is brave enough to face a new challenge in what could be described as a varied history with motorcycles. Oh, she's doing good. She's doing good. I'm not having to worry about it like I did on the first lap. I was worried whether she was even going to be able to hold on. But she's doing, she's coming along. I could probably pick up the pace a little bit. It was pretty cool. It was exciting. Um, I've never been, I've ridden with him before on a motorbike, but I've never been on the side car before. I've always wanted to do it. True. After you've done about five laps, you start to ache, and it's like, okay, I've had enough, I want to stop. Right? Even though you're still having a lot of fun, you think, okay, this is the last lap, this is the last lap, this is the last corner, I've, I've got to get off. <laughs> I have an artificial leg, and uh, the first time that I went out, I came back and the bottom of my boot was scraped right off because my foot was hanging off the bottom of here and hitting the, the tarmac. Look at my foot! Oh! Did it hit the... Yeah, She's did got, it hit? She's got passenger boot! <laughs> <laughs> okay, you ready? Took it right off, you can see. So this round, I decided to take my leg off. It would be more easier, and it was a lot better. It was more comfortable, I had more control. And did you go faster, Steve? Well, because she was lighter. <laughs> Growing up in neighboring towns in East Yorkshire, England, Steve and Bobby didn't meet until their 20s. Steve, however, knew of her long before they dated as the girl who had the motorbike accident. I wasn't going out with Stephen then. Um, I was 16 years old. Um, just coming up to exams at school and I'd met this guy, I knew him for seven days and uh, he actually came round to my house, picked me up earlier than what was expected so I just grabbed my things and we left um, and we were heading over to his house and um, I remember going along um, this road, it was called Sutton Road and we went around a roundabout I remember just going over a rise in the road and then I saw a car coming the opposite way and um, I just screamed, like, watch out for that car and it seemed to echo because I thought it was going to cut the car, like, right down the middle. But what happened was um, the car driver swerved and the bike swerved this way and the headlight of the car hit my knee, just took the leg right off. So... Um, I was thrown 106 feet away from the scene of the accident. I broke my arm and fractured my pelvis in two places. When I was picked up and taken to the hospital, my parents were brought by a police car and the hospital said, well, we'll give her 48 hours to live, but we don't expect her to make it over the weekend. So, 36 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> climbing, on, climbing on side cars. <laughs> Doing 170 miles an hour. <laughs> I don't see myself as being disabled. I see myself as being like everybody else. I've got two arms, two legs. Um, I don't let it stop me from doing anything. She's crazy. That's what she does, right? I think it's good that she got her racing license, so that's pretty, that's nifty. I don't really know how she actually gets on the back of the sidecar and does it, but I'm sure it'd be a lot easier if her circumstances were different, right? But she still does it anyway. It's a dangerous spot to get into. <laughs> That's why she only goes out with me. It's dangerous as dangerous can get. And then things will spit a passenger out in an instant and the passenger didn't see it coming. That's what worries me. That's why I can't push it with her arm.
we just couldn't do it. We had too many arguments, always, you know, I know better than you. Brothers, you know, too close, can't do it. So it's better we got our own little thing going now. Yeah, and it's good because we ended up bringing other people into it. Yeah. And, uh, like, I mean, it's grown exponentially since then. Uh, you know. I don't want to race with him. He doesn't want to race with me. So, so we brought a lot of hey, yeah, hey, people. You, uh, you want to come here? Yeah. It's not for fame or fortune. We get no recognition. There is no money in it. No, the money that flies out of my wallet. Uh, no, it's just all about having fun. Man, it's a great group of people. Great camaraderie. I mean, I wish that we could make money out of it, but that's not the reality. But we just do it because we like it. Because it's a blast. Someday we'll get the factory going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> At this racetrack, they're probably hitting roughly, Frank, I think about 140 miles an hour on the back straight. So these, th these things are incredibly fast. I made a promise to my wife a long, long time ago, if I ever won the number one championship, I would quit racing. And fortunately, in 2002, I did. There's pictures of me four years old in a sidecar, my father's sidecar. It's just something that, I don't know if it's bred in me, or just something I'm very used to and something I've always wanted to do. My father raced, I just grew up knowing sidecars. We used to sidecar race in bed. We'd stick a pillow behind us, be one would be the driver, one of my brothers would be the passenger. And we would just, we would bedroom race. Just something I've always dreamed of doing, and I did it. Kevin's dad was one of the original founding members of the Sidecar Racers Association. Kevin has long been on the association's executive himself, and as a retired racer, is now the announcer who calls the races at the track. There's no seat belts, as you can see. Our only protection are our leathers, our helmet, our gloves, our boots, and hopefully our peace of mind to know to basically pass out if you do fall off it. I injured my shoulder last year at Mossport on the number 17 cycle when the rear end broke and it tore the cartilage in my arm. And that's, it's, it's one of the things you do, you, we accept it, you hang on, you do your job, you have a lot of communication between your driver and passenger. If you're a passenger, your driver's doing something you don't like, when you're done your session, you get off, you have a quiet time and say your trailer, your motorhome, your car, or the van, the bathroom, it doesn't matter, and you sit down and you discuss it. And again, the driver will do the same thing with the passenger. If he's in the wrong spot, He'll tell you, I said, if the bike's kicking out this way, I need you to stop being there and go here. It's, it's a, it's a love-hate relationship with driver and passenger. We all hate it when we're passed and we blame the other guy. Right, I knew you'd get around me anyway, so I figured there was no point in pushing you wide. You don't have to win. You have to finish the race, be comfortable, enjoy what you're doing, and come back and relax and hang out with all your buddies. <laughs> that was good, I couldn't get in the area. Yeah, this does it. This is probably the most exciting form of racing there is on asphalt. It's family oriented. We all bring our families to the racetrack. We hang out together. We mourn together. We do everything together. It's an obsession. I think, like any sport, you can be obsessed with it, can't you? So it's an obsession. And sidecars are strange, raced by strange people, different types of people, so. When you get one of these things going fast and you're on the limit of tyre ad adhesion and brakes and everything, the passenger is as good as the driver. If he's not in the right place at the right time, you're both in trouble, so the passenger is an, an underrated thing. racing with Rob and we're having a great season together, uh, doing really well. I've progressed a lot, learned a lot and, uh, and uh, keep going faster and faster. I've heard passengers have been called monkeys. Yeah, I think that's a terrible thing to call them, yeah. Yeah, why, why upset the monkeys?
it's exciting for me. When I called him and said, are you going? He said, yes, and I said, am I? And he said, I hope so, so I'm here. His mom said, you're crazy. You go and watch your grandson get killed. And I said, look, he could get killed crossing the street. And um, if it's something he wants to do, I want to support him. I'm an adrenaline junkie. I have been since I was in high school, and uh, I wrestled for four years. And uh, that's been basically me ever since. Can't turn back once you turn adrenaline junkie. <laughs> My t-shirt, I think the one that he likes to see me wear is uh, um, tour the country on a Kawasaki. <laughs> because I used to have cows, and I had a cow collection. My kids were always giving me cow things, and uh, I had this cow t-shirt. <laughs> don't tell him about the snowmobile. Oh, <laughs> snowmobile, yeah. He took me for a ride on a snowmobile. Not, not this past winter, but the winter before. It wasn't much snow, but he said there was enough so we could go. We started. He tipped me off five times and thought it was funny. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> and so we both laughed really, really hard. And he'd reach down to get my hand. I'd try to reach up and get his, and I was laughing so hard that it was hard to get back on the snowmobile. <laughs> From snowmobiles to sidecars, in her 70s, Grandma Chris feels the need for speed. I just rode around the, the outside of the track once. <laughs> I enjoy it. But I promised my doctor I wouldn't get on it this weekend. Wanted to get on a sidecar yeah. this weekend. Yeah, I would have if somebody had given me a ride. I'd have a good time. <laughs> you probably ought to behave. I mean, you just had your knee replaced. So. I just had total knee replacement, so I can't do much of anything right now. But that's okay. Kyle passengers for Mike on Team Bulldog. Together they've had their share of wins and losses and close calls. Most people think of, of sidecar racing as a driver and a passenger. It's not really. It's a two-person team and you have to be one. With sidecars, it really is a team. You can have the best driver in the world, but if the passenger is no good, you're not going to win. It's a, it's a serious butterfly reaction. It's almost indescribable. With any sport, I mean, you know, there's a, why do you do it? I mean, it's fun, but you do it because there's a risk of danger, you know, I mean, it's, it's just the fact that you can push something and, you know, it's on the edge. Well, we've been off the track a couple of times, but we've never actually hit anything. Um, we had a, a slight problem at Wisconsin last year. I thought it was a flat tire, and uh, I happened to be looking back at the time that it, it blew, and there was a serious cloud of smoke, and I said, you know, I don't think that's a flat tire. I know everyone has their own different ways of reacting um, when something unexpected happens. Now, with me, I go really quiet. I don't shout and scream, but it got to this stage when he was coming down the hill, I thought, why isn't he off the track? I looked back forward and there was flames all around Mike's rear side and uh, so I decided it was getting hot around my right leg so I moved it and there was about three feet of flame shooting out the back of the bike and I decided that this was not a good scene. Oh, it was scary, very scary. I think I was jumping up and down saying, get off that thing, get off that thing. He didn't want to stop on the track because he didn't want, obviously, to stop the race. We slowly made it down to the corner, got off the track, and surprisingly enough, we never lost a drop of oil on the track. The flames were just flying right out way behind it. That last few seconds, I, I must admit, I, I thought it was going to blow up. How I ever got off the, the grandstand that day when he had that accident, I don't even know how I got off the stand. Just about the time that we got the bike put out and the body off and everything was all safe, and we was getting ready to push the bike off the track so we could get it towed up to our pits, and she, uh, she came down. We ran down where they were, and then I gave him a hug and found out he was okay. And she, uh, she grabbed hold of me and she says, don't you ever dare go to another race without me. And uh, this, that was quite an emotional time, and, and uh, she's been to everyone since. got some pretty good blisters on his ankles, but uh, that was considerably minor considering what we went through. This race season, 
Veteran F2 driver Brian has found himself a new passenger who happens to be his daughter, Shelby. Well, I'm 16 years old. I'm in grade 10 at Tugwa Secondary School. And um, I started sidecar racing because it's fun and my dad does it. It's just really cool. Shelby is not your average 16-year-old girl. She likes to drive the tractor on the family farm and also has learned to be a welder. She rides her dirt bike around the property and plays her guitar in the trophy racing room. But she is still daddy's little girl. Some people are into being cool and hanging off the rig and it's, it looks good in that, but it's not always necessary. Brian is an instructor for the sidecar race school that takes place at the beginning of the race season. Here at Shannonville in April, the students have the opportunity to walk the track, learning the layout before hopping on the rigs for their first time. What you want to do is you want the passenger on your back, drive the front end down. He's been coaching me for months in some of the corners, how to move and that, and like to get on his back to plant the front wheel and plant the chair wheel and everything. <laughs> good she was where she had to be we'll start turning the wick up a little bit every session should get a little quicker and a little quicker but just whether she's gonna be strong enough I think we're gonna have to feed her lots of potatoes and pasta get a little meat on her bones yeah. good cool <laughs> Brian is going to make sure his passenger is ready for the big race at Road America. Brian and Oliver are the fastest team on the track in Canada. Known as Team Brahma, they set the lap record on the 2.47 mile pro track at Shannonville of 113.81. Again, it's a 2004? 2003. 2003 ART chassis, which is out of Europe. And when you see this thing, you, you'll just be in awe. This, this thing is basically stuck on rails the entire race. And this passenger here, Brian, he just sort of hangs on for the ride. And believe me, he does hang on. We, we've seen some pretty uh, scary things they've done, but they, they seem to have a knack of winning a race. This is our uh, second year. Second year. So yeah, first yeah. year first out. First year was last year, and uh, yeah, we got the championship. And again, once this body's off, you just look at there's basically nothing to it. And if you look at the sidecar behind us, the number 35 there, the yellow one, that was actually the first, we call them worms, that was brought into North America. And that, that sidecar there had the number one stuck on its uh, nose for I think seven years in a row. So there, there is a lot of history here at the track right now with the first and now the newest we have. The fiberglass fairing can easily be removed to get at the engine underneath. This thing here is basically got world championship technology written on it. Uh, it's a front A-arm configuration, which is the most modern suspension steering setup they have. We've got a 2005 Suzuki GSX-R1000 engine in it. You had a Yamaha last year. Why did you go to Suzuki? Well, everyone's running with Suzuki, I think. It's even in Europe, right? Everyone's running Superside in Europe. 
it's norm to go with a Suzuki. So I think it's a lot easier too to uh, tune the engines and, and also if, if you got other people racing with the same engines, you can, you know, if you blow up, you can swap, they they swap motors and yeah, pretty much. That was our biggest problem at Road America because we were running an older R1. Nobody had any parts because, you know, everyone's running AMA, everyone's running top of line brand new stuff, so. Well, that's, there's absolutely no weight on that. that that's basically one-handed. One arm. Yeah. That, yeah, that you can really see the importance of a passenger being They're a lot lighter. Be. You know, even the, you can lift the whole thing up. You know, these bikes are made to go fast, and the faster you go, the smoother they get. You talk to guys over in Europe, and, you know, after I spoke to the guy I bought it from, he, you know, called me up and said, you know, how was it? And I said, well, it's great, but it's really twitchy. He says, you're going too slow. Because you got to go faster. Even though they're racing with one of the newest rigs in the club, the competition on the track is going to be fierce. Next year is Frank Riola, which is in the SRE West. He's the fastest guy over there. So there's been a bit of a challenge between the both of us. And, you know, I got, got pretty much the exact same thing that he does. And, and it's going to be a good showdown this year, Road America. we got to get this thing dialed in and lose some weight and build up our cardio. We think we can do relatively well. Uh, we, we think we have some good speed, so we're gonna go over there and try it out and have some fun. Frank and Dennis are the fastest team in the U.S. The radar gun has clocked them at 178 miles per hour. But is this enough to beat Oliver and Brian in the showdown at Road America? I've been racing sidecars about 13 years. Start off as a passenger. And I figured out there's three things I can't do. Passenger, wakeboard, and play basketball. And so uh, I drive now. Uh, I used to race two wheels. I race all kinds of stuff. And um, you know, I saw the sidecars and I tried it. <clears throat> and the, the adrenaline, the uniqueness of it uh, drew me to the sport and the people. Uh, it, you know, when you show up to a race, there's a, you know 500 motorcycles and there's 20 sidecars. And just being, you know, you're this high off the ground, you're going 175 miles an hour, you got a guy on the back that helps you control the bike, it's the only sport in the world you can do that. A lot of it is a social thing too. Fast, fun, traveling, frustrating at times, spending money. Well, on the ride out here, I kept, I kept doing my chicken invitation just to annoy him. <laughs> After a while, everybody started doing it. It just sort of became a kind of a joke, inside joke. So I told him if we get on the podium, I was going to do my chicken imitation. No, he's better at it than I am. We're dog pound racing. That's why we got the ears. So as we're going down the straightaway, these things are flopping straight back. And if you can imagine, I'm the driver up in front and my passenger's in back with and we got four years flopping in the breeze. It's just uh, hilarious. There's not a whole bunch of money in this. In fact, I've yet to get paid for any of it. A lot of money out of our pockets going out, but we have such a good time. The people are absolutely family members. Sidecar racing is very unusual. Everybody thinks that there's just a driver and this, this guy just stands in the back and hangs on. Um, the truth of it is, it's a teamwork um, program. My analogy of it is uh, you've got two people dancing. When they're working together, they're romantic, they're graceful, and everything flows together. If one person is off, you notice it. Everything is off. The car gets upset because the body's in the wrong place. Um, if the driver is off, that he goes over curbs and, and the, throws the driver off and it becomes a very lopsided thing. So you have to work together as a team. It's at the point where if, if one person is so far off, you, you have the possibilities of crashing. James, what are we doing? Um, wasting time in Chicago right now. Sitting in the airport, waiting for our plane to get here so we can go to uh, Ingle Land. Ingle Land? What's an Ingle Land? Uh, our motor and sidecar. Ah. Both James Cornell and myself uh, won West Coast completely, both north and south. And it was our goal to uh, run to the Isle of Man. We, we hit the pinnacle and that's that was the one thing and we were at the brass ring and we were grabbing for it. 
we purchased the car sight on scene. We went over there, we rebuilt the car in a parking lot. Um, and people just came out of the woodworks going, oh, you're the Yanks that are coming over to try our stuff. Come on, Chris, get your flag, do it. Do it. Uh, to give you guys a quick little note here. We are here. That's Liverpool down here. That's Liverpool. We need We're to go. Here. We need to go up there. All the way up there. So we almost just hit this big truck. <laughs> you know, they say do not block the intersection, which everybody does. Weird. So there's some lady driving there. Can use their own maps against them because they don't know where the hell they are. Even the cab drivers use the TomTom Tom GPS stuff. And they still get lost. Yeah, exactly. The Isle of Man is a small island in the Irish Sea known for its high-speed races on public roads. The exciting TT, or tourist trophy racing, is an event that puts spectators curbside. The exhausting sidecar course covers 113 miles over three laps. Taking our first lap around in the van. We already did Quarter Bridge and Union Mills. The no speed limit signs can just pass through. Technically, you can go as fast as you can. <laughs> so, we'll hopefully have it better. Oh, this is not going to be good. Uh, hopefully, they'll have this bank. That's going to be a tough one. So, what do you think so far? This is going to be one fun race. Finally, we got through tech and scrutineering is what they call it, which is uh, a lot more than what we have in the States. And of course, we're in strange territory, so we're all nervous and shaking. Then we went out and we we went out on practice. Unfortunately, they, another team in front of us had pulled off on the inside and slowed down to a stop. And the turn marshals didn't see them or they didn't know they were there. But as we came out of a town called Ramsey, we were probably doing 80 miles an hour and they were just getting back up into speed and pulling into the race line. They were doing about 40. So instead of just rear-ending the heck out of them. I had a chance to go around a, a blinding corner. And unfortunately, we just did not have enough space around them. So we ended up locking it up sideways and hitting a cobblestone wall to avoid the car in front of us. And um, my partner, James Cornell, is, is to this day is still in the hospital. Well, it's hard to see, but this is what's left of the old sidecar. Yeah, she's pretty banged up. That's the uh, passenger wheel right through there. As you can see, it's uh, bent up and around. She took a good beating. I'll sign up before I cry. <laughs> the truth of it is, the, the, the people on the island were awesome. Nobles Hospital, all the doctors, all the nurses, they had several different wings that had, had seen him and knew about him, came up to his room and visited him daily. Um, the nurses, even though they are not supposed to, took buckets, went downtown and collected money on their own. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm choking up. On their own, collected money. The high school got on the ferry boats and went around and had a James Cornell fund. It was awesome. The James Cornell Fund was established to help alleviate some of the financial burden of James's ever-growing medical expenses. JamesCornellFund.org is a place for friends to chat about their visits with James and talk about his progress. We gathered about forty thousand dollars in fundraisers um, here in the United States, just on the on the whim that we had an accident, we had problems. Um, we donated another. Uh, what was our racing budget, which was 10 grand for the rest of the season, we donated it all to him. And the hospital was willing to take that money for, and he spent almost two months by this time, in intensive care, which is not even close to what the bill was. The 
the airplane flight was almost $70,000 just to bring him from England to the United States because he had to have two doctors and a nurse on board and then they had to have a return flight back. So it was a, it was a lot of money to get him here. Um, I'm glad that he's home because um, now he's got friends that stop in daily. He bumped his head, his, his brain actually sloshed forward inside his skull. He, he lost recognition of a lot of things. He's reading now, he's watching TV. Um, his short-term memory is the part that we're working on, but every day, every week, we see a little bit of more progress. And so we pray to God every day that it, he gets better. I, I wake up every day and I, uh, I thank God that I'm, I'm, I am who I am. I humble myself because there are people that are um, less fortunate than me. As I'm racing, I think a little more cautiously. I look to make sure that I'm not doing a little fling by a pass and might put somebody else into jeopardy. And I think everybody else does too. We do this out of the love of it, um, the thrill of it, the excitement of it. And we're also carrying somebody else with us. Well, this is Road America, and uh, we're in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. Uh, we've been here 52 years. First race was here in 1955 in September. But they started racing here actually around Elkhart Lake in the town in 1950, 51, and 52. They had three different courses that they raced, and that's how racing came to Elkhart Lake. And it was so successful, but it wasn't really too smart to race on the uh, city streets <laughs> in the county here. So they decided to uh, build a permanent facility, and we've been racing here on the same road course for 52 years. It's the uh, fastest road course in the world today because it's remained unchanged. And uh, we're 628 acres currently, and uh, it's like a national park. As a racer, the track is just awesome. It's got everything. It's fast, it's demanding, and uh, you know, there's a big danger element, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Road America is the ultimate racing venue for sports cars, motorcycles, and sidecars. The motorcycles can reach speeds up to 200 miles per hour on the front straight, and the sidecars, well, about 180. This four-mile track has 14 turns, a wicked kink, a winding carousel, and various levels of elevation. The event is a AMA Suzuki Superbike Doubleheader, a championship uh, event for uh, Superbike, so it has a lot of prestige. Oh, the big one that got uh, set a new lap record yesterday, Matt Maladin and, uh, and certainly Ben Spees with Yoshimura Suzuki are here, and uh, they're totally different personalities. Uh, Ben is fun, will talk to anybody. Matt is dead serious, doesn't talk to anybody. Uh, they're totally opposite. They, they don't even talk between each other. You know, Other personalities you'll see. I know that Michael Jordan will be here with Team Jordan. Uh, and uh, he's brought a lot of notoriety to uh, the event. Just uh, people who are not interested in motorcycle racing now are looking at it because uh, of the personality that he is. He is a big motorcycle guy. He's uh, one of the top teams now, and that's kind of cool. A lot of people, you know, started their careers and had a lot of great experience here. Paul is a, an, uh, an avid race fan, a team owner now of Newman Haas. He's a big car guy and uh, has been racing here for most of his life. Uh, he's a, another private individual but enjoys the sport, is a great fan just like anybody. Standing next to him at a race, he has the same passion and excitement. Uh, you wouldn't know that he was, you know, anyone else. We've been going out for a lot of years and we've built a fan base with the track and the people, so it's a really important race for us to do because if we are going to grow, you need the exposure and for us really Road America is probably the, you know, the number one place for getting that.
We have nine spectator events this year. This is one of four larger events, and they're relatively stable, but we typically will get 40 to 45,000 you know, over the, the course of the event at this. Uh, our advanced sales were up this year, but it's all weather dependent. Half of it uh, comes in at the gate on Saturday and Sunday, so we'll see. We are one of four tracks on the schedule that are actually certified for rain racing. Uh, I know a lot of the riders uh, don't like to. I know that most of the sidecars are, you know, not going to do that, but uh, that says a lot for the circuit, and we hope uh, that we have a dry race. The uh, sun's been playing with us a little bit along with some rain clouds, and we hope that the, the sun plays more. We're, we're shooting a movie. I'm gonna go outside, out, come back in, and then we're just gonna drive straight up. Do I have to stop and show you anything? No. I've got my pit pass no, there. you don't have to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. This is the third storm we've had now in the past 24 hours. Thunder, lightnings, we've been here before where canopies have been blowing all over the place. Uh, Ewan and Paul, they were here one weekend and Ewan's canopy actually went through Paul's tent and Paul was in the tent. I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's Lake Michigan effect they have, but there's always one day here that you wish you were back home. But after a 12 hour drive getting here, you really don't want to turn around and leave. In modern car racing today, all you see is the top of the helmet. And you, you don't see all the activity, the, you know, the double clutching, the footwork, the, all the activity inside the cockpit. But on, uh, on a sidecar and on a bike, you can see the rider and the passenger going through their mechanics and their technical movements to uh, go the fastest through a turn. Sidecars are lined up there yet or not? They already gave them the first call. Yeah, I give them, uh, tell them to get their butts in gear. Once again, sidecars should be ready to go. Sidecars should be ready to go. We're going to have a real quick turnaround. the number one's got the hole shot followed by the 270 and the 14 darts up the inside of the 1E to take third place from Ewan Brown and Paul Boyd.
what you'll see, the sidecars with less horsepower may actually get a nice run on the high-powered rigs due to the fact this track is a little wet as we see the number one followed by the 271. I'm thinking you might see that 351 Formula 2 sidecar get past coming up the front straight here as he is trying to outrun some 1,000 powered motorcycles. We're going to have to see the drive he get, that he got off there as we watch the number 271 stretching, stretching his lead a bit over the number one of Frank Riola. The pinnacle race at Road America may be safely completed for this year, but the racers immediately start looking to the road ahead. They will work hard maintaining and tuning their machines with one simple goal, crossing the finish line sooner. We're just gonna go ahead and congratulate our number one team. First place side, first place sidecar for the entire weekend, the defending super side North American champion. Yeah! Frank Riola and Dennis Kruger. These guys are pumped up there. They had a great battle with uh, Rama and DeRay. Murray and Murray came home in third. They came out of nowhere to take home that third place. Now let's go talk to the driver, the winning driver, the number one sidecar, Frank Riola. Frank, tell me what you did out there to keep that number 271 behind you. Close my eyes and uh, kept it wide open. <laughs> this is a man of very few where I know he is pumped, the sweat just pouring off his head, he's half naked here in front of us now, which is not something we really want to see, Frank. Well, with our victory ceremony for our sidecar, go ahead. All right, we got, we've got our number one sidecar, the winners of this weekend up here. Gentlemen, here are your mugs, spray that champagne, and please don't spray me. Ladies and gentlemen, our champions of the weekend, Frank Rio and Dennis Kruger, the defending Super Sidecar North American champions, and they're well on the way again to doing that this coming year.